Hey, it's Mike here, and today, the colors of plant foods and their unique health effects. Does a blueberry have a different health effect than a yellow fruit or a green leaf or a red tomato? You know the answer is yes, but the interesting part is what the different effects are and how colors can even make it into different parts of your body and have a benefit there. And of course, we're gonna be talking about whole plant foods because when they say eat the rainbow, they're not talking about eating Skittles in their artificial nasty colors or eating a literal entire mini rainbow like Lucky Charms. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> And if you're like me, you wanna know why these different pigments are the way they are. So we're gonna get a little bit into the chemistry, but not go too hard, because it gets super nerdy and complicated really fast. And also thank you to Justin for suggesting this video. Let's go. Right off the bat, you might be wondering, where am I? I am in Barcelona in my brother's apartment, which is great, but I'm also using a really flimsy travel tripod. So if my camera goes like this, I'm sorry, anyway, moving on. For a little bit of background, our attraction to colorful fruits and vegetables goes way back millions of years, and that has to do with the primate angiosperm coevolution hypothesis, which essentially means that our primate ancestors evolved eating the fruits from flowering trees over time, and it was a symbiotic relationship. So we would be attracted to these fruits because of the way that they looked in their colors, and then we would eat them and spread their seeds around, help the trees grow, get food. It worked out well. But now in modern times, the food industry has used our love for these bright colors around food to sell us a bunch of artificial crap. So we wanna get back to the basics of the original phytochemicals that we were attracted to. I do need to start off by making a very important point, and that is that it would be really simple if just all red foods had the same effect on us, all green foods have the same effect. It'd probably be a really simple, nice, high-viewed video, who knows? But the reality is that there are even different phytochemicals that can create the same color and have completely different health effects. So we're gonna learn about these phytochemicals in a pretty good amount of detail and what their health benefits are, because it is the case that virtually every one of these actual chemical pigments has health benefits, which is pretty awesome. Now in this video, we are going to be working our way down the actual visible light spectrum and the different foods on that, which is gonna be great. But in order to really understand what's going on, we have to get a little bit into the chemistry first. Trust me, it's worth getting to first. We have to start by answering the question, how the heck do different phytochemicals even result in different colors? And that brings me to something that sounds a bit complicated, but you'll realize it's not that complicated, and that is what is known in chemistry as conjugated bonds, where you have either a double or a triple bond that is then connected to a single bond, and then you can have chains of those. And in the case of colored phytochemicals, it is generally a double bond and a single bond, and then you will get chains of those. And to the best of my knowledge, the more chains of those, the more frequencies of light are absorbed. And then the remaining light that is not absorbed is reflected into your eye. So for example, lycopene in tomatoes, which we'll get to at the end, is a very long chain of these conjugated bonds. And that absorbs essentially everything down to red, which is what you then see as a result. And as this chemistry site mentions, these conjugated chains are colorless until they reach eight bonds. And then with every double bond added, the system absorbs photons of longer wavelength and that shifts the color. Two more really interesting points is that bleach breaks up these chains. So if you are to break lycopene into chains that are shorter than eight, all of a sudden you won't see red anymore even though all of those same chemicals will essentially still be there. Or if you use hydrogenation to strip the conjugated bonds off lycopene, it can still be the same length, but it's going to be colorless. Super interesting. Finally, and perhaps most importantly for health, is that these colored conjugated bond chains tend to have extra room for electrons, which means they can mop up those free radicals and that oxidative stress, and that they are antioxidants. You got it. Oh, you, you didn't get it. It's okay, maybe next time. Anyway, let's get to the visible light spectrum, work our way down from the top up in the violet and purplish zone all the way down to red, because red is honestly the most interesting, unique one here, but they're all great. So let's keep going. In food descriptions, purple and violet kind of blend together. I'm not a master of color, you can argue in the comments, but we're talking about foods like purple sweet potatoes, some grapes, even though they're different colors, blackberries, plums, eggplants, figs, purple carrots, and one that I have seen mentioned as violet specifically is the acai berry. 
What makes it violet? Well, this whole upper section of the spectrum is largely dominated by anthocyanins, a group of antioxidants that has quite a big color range. Anthocyanins possess antioxidative and antimicrobial activities, improve visual and neurological health, and protect against various non-communicable diseases, like heart disease. The hard benefits are honestly surprisingly wide sweeping and pretty rad. I mean, look at this graphic from this review. We can see all of these benefits, mainly downstream effects of mopping up oxidative stress, like less oxidized LDL, which of course causes lesions in the arteries, good stuff. And to understand more about the different anthrocyanins, we can look to grapes, which have a varying color. Obviously purple, Concord grapes can be blue. We'll get into that in a little bit, but there are sites like this one that break down the types of anthocyanins. And so grapes, for example, have cyanidin, delphinidin, petunidin, peonidin, and malvidin. They're just dominated by slightly different ones and that leads to a different color. And that's true across a bunch of these plants. And at this point you might be thinking, grapes, what about resveratrol, that antioxidant? We don't care about that at all because it's essentially colorless. I don't care what benefits it has. That's not what this video is about. It's about color. Next up, sliding on down the spectrum, we've got blue. And blue is actually quite rare in terms of foods for true blue, but we have that Concord grape I just mentioned. We've got blue potatoes, we've got elderberries, and we've got your favorite, or my favorite, blueberries. Blueberries. And again, this is dominated by anthocyanins, a mix of anthocyanins, but the closest one here to blue appears to be delphinidin. And according to the study, the benefits directly from delphinidin include, you know, the basic mopping up of free radicals, but also helping to prevent cancer angiogenesis, which is the formation of new blood vessels that feed cancer. You don't want those. Delphinidin, good. I'm delphinidin, eat some blueberries. Now, screw you angiogenesis. This is what I do in between every cut of videos whenever I'm talking about benefits of food. And this is where I wanna expand our minds a little bit because just because a anthocyanin or pigment is a particular color doesn't mean the food is going to end up appearing that way. In the end, it can be drowned out by other compounds. And that brings me to how delphinidin is one of the main anthocyanins in these foods. I mean, we're talking pomegranate, black beans, black soy, eggplants, and even wheat and rye. So keep that in mind. And as we're wrapping up most of the information on anthocyanins in particular, before we move on to other colors, it's worth looking at some charts like this, where you can see the different chemical structures of these anthocyanins and their corresponding color. And yeah, those can be a little exaggerated, but if we actually look at real samples of these, you can see from these little mini plastic dishes, that's what they look like in real life. Of course, different compounds can make the final result different. All right, now let's move on to green plants. And you already know what the winner is here. It is chlorophyll. Although looking through the research, I was surprised at how little human research there actually is. We know it's a powerful antioxidant, but most of the research has simply been done in animals. It was considered a potent inhibitor of the carcinogen aflatoxin when it came to inducing liver DNA damage. It also really helped fight pancreatic cancer in mice. But there is some interesting older data about applying chlorophyll topically to wounds, increasing wound healing speed, and that is pretty cool. Also, there's some sort of mediocre evidence that it can help regenerate red blood cells because the molecule is so similar to blood that it can supply those building blocks. We need some randomized control trials on that anyway. And why not add a final study in humans, small pilot study, who knows if this will be true, but topically adding chlorophyll appeared to improve acne in terms of the global acne assessment scale, talking about facial oiliness, number of acne lesions, etc., which is interesting. We need more data. And you might just be wondering, what's the best way to get the most chlorophyll? You can go really hard into things like moringa powder or do wheatgrass juice, but you can also just get it from some foods that have pretty high levels, including celery, alfalfa, Brussels sprouts, cilantro, spinach, and kale. And then it kind of goes down from there, but you know, you get the point. Now sliding further down the visible light spectrum, we hit yellow and that brings me to the carotenoid zone, starting out with lutein, which is the only yellow carotenoid. And it in particular is beneficial for the eyes along with zeaxanthin, which is actually more orange, which we aren't to yet but they quote, block blue light from reaching the underlying structures in the retina, thereby reducing the risk of light induced oxidative damage that could lead to macular degeneration and higher levels of lutein and zeaxanthin in the diet are associated with lower levels of macular degeneration. 
And I would go further and say that according to this study, they actually can bioaccumulate in the eye a little bit and help slow the formation of cataracts, unlike beta carotene, which we'll get to in a bit in the orange zone. And real quick, it seems to be a carotenoid effect in general that it will absorb into your skin and increase the yellowness of your skin, which several studies find to be more attractive, which is pretty cool. And of course that will also protect from UV damage a bit. This is why SpongeBob is a sex icon. True fact. And in the yellow zone, we also have quercetin, which I've talked about a little bit. And I have to say it is in its unique category known as flavanols. And it's kind of confusing until you look at a chart like this one, which really breaks it all down. You can see where anthocyanins are. You can see where quercetin is. And this is where it once again gets annoying because there isn't some obvious yellow food that's high in quercetin. No, it sort of integrates itself into other foods. Like one of the highest is capers, which are those little green things that are usually preserved in a jar. And to make it even more annoying, red onions, pretty decent source of this yellow quercetin. And to nutshell the benefits of quercetin, it appears to be a MAO inhibitor, which means it's going to slow the breakdown of things like serotonin. And from this study, it appears to increase the amount of time until exhaustion for cyclists likely due to the lower inflammation, but also might have to do with glucose uptake as well. And the inflammation effect appears to be so profound that supplementing at least with it for COVID patients decreased C-reactive protein and inflammation marker by 50%. And at least according to this smaller randomized control trial, decreased the amount of time that people were infected. I wanna see another study on that, but had to mention it. And finally, just so I don't leave anybody out, there is another yellow pigment that could have health benefits, and that is beta xanthin, which appears to only be in the prickly pear cactus fruit, and I would love to see more research on that. It is part of the larger group beta lanes. I'm gonna call them beta lanes because they are in beets as well, which we'll get to when we get to red, but we first have to hit orange. Beta carotene is probably the most well-known one here. And I will say studies where it's isolated show negative effects. So you gotta get it directly from food. And just, just to quickly demonstrate how beneficial it is, this study on all-cause mortality showed that higher levels of blood beta carotene were associated with between 17 and 31% lower all-cause mortality, depending on which model they used. And from this study, it has a potent antioxidant capacity with a variety of health benefits, such as lowering risk of heart disease, certain types of cancers, enhancing the immune system, and protecting from age-related macular degeneration. And I did just talk about zeaxanthin, which often pairs with lutein and its benefit for the eye, and that one is orange as well. And next we have curcumin, which is a pigment itself. It is orange on the polyphenol chart. It's over away from some of the other ones, but it still is conjugated. So therefore it gives that orange appearance. I've covered the benefits before a lot, but from this paper quote, it aids in the management of oxidative and inflammatory conditions, metabolic syndrome, arthritis, anxiety, and hyperlipidemia like high cholesterol. Now there is one anthocyanin that can get this far down on the spectrum, and that is Pilargonidin. Let's say I said that right and it is high in foods like strawberries, radish, plums, and pomegranates. And there appears to be a unique health effect. Again, ugh, animal studies very early on, but it might help neutralize beta amyloid plaques, which of course play a crucially negative role in Alzheimer's. And finally, we're moving all the way down to red, which of course brings us to lycopene in tomatoes. And from this paper, quote, Lycopene has the greatest antioxidant potential among carotenoids. So we're just learning so much here. And a lot of it has to do with not becoming red from the sun, as I recently mentioned in my sunscreen video, but to this other paper, interestingly, lycopene has been reported as the antioxidant most quickly depleted in skin upon UV irradiation, which implies that it is like a UV blocking battery that you can deplete as you're exposed. Lycopene, of course, also has heart benefits because it's red, so it has to. I'm joking. We don't, everything doesn't have to make sense. Anyway, in case you're wondering what the best source of lycopene is, obviously tomatoes are a great source, but there are two other sources you might not be aware of, and that is guava, which is even higher than tomatoes, and watermelon. But you may have heard you need to be cooking lycopene to really get the most out of it, and that is because it is bonded to fiber. So that might be the case with guava, which has a bit higher fiber, but watermelon is super low fiber, so on that hot day in the sun, you're gonna be doing extra good to eat some watermelon for lycopene. And there are a couple more red pigments, including betalanes in particular, beta cyanin, which is in only things like beets and Swiss chard, amaranth, 
and some dragon fruit as well as tubers. Also, once again, they have those conjugated bonds and in addition to just being an antioxidant, as this paper mentions, they have quote, anti-inflammatory, cognitive impairment, anti-cancer and anti-hepatitis properties. Interesting. And finally, for our last anthocyanin, which is cyanidin, does shift all the way down to red here. You know, it's in some grapes, bilberries, blackberries, even blueberries, to be confusing, but cherries, choke cherries, cranberries, elderberries, hawthorn, loganberry, acai berry, and raspberry. And from this paper, the antioxidant properties and other health benefits include anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, anti-diabetic, anti-toxicity, cardiovascular, and nervous protective capacities. And just in case you're wondering like me, does more color mean more protection to this study? It does appear that generally the more color intensity a fruit has, or plant has, the more antioxidant capacity it has as well. All right, in conclusion, I could go on even more. I'm cutting out so much information, but this video could become like an hour long. And I have my old laptop here that I'm traveling with. And as I get closer to a 20 minute video, it just gets slower and slower editing. So we're gonna, we're gonna start cutting it off. But to sum it up, eat the rainbow in terms of whole plant foods. And yes, those pigments themselves have unique and awesome health benefits. And then just the overarching antioxidant capacity. Another thing worth mentioning is that not all antioxidants will make it to the same place. We saw that a little bit with skin, but that means it's good to have a variety of antioxidants, a variety of these food pigments to be as healthy as you can be, tomato. I did too much research on this one, I'm losing it. I went deep into the chemistry and I will link another video below if you wanna get more into that and the whole spectroscopy stuff. But I also was recently at the UK Vegan Camp Out, but I made it a day late, so I was only able to film part of it. If you'd still like to see that video, shorter one on that, then let me know down below. Anyway, also feel free to like and subscribe and all that good stuff that helps me out. And I will see you in the next video, which will once again be in Barcelona. <laughs>